Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on packaging and storage of your EFT sensitive devices. Uh, my name is Tim Hacker. I'm the Regional Sales Manager for Desco Europe and I am one of two presenters today. Also presenting with me is Vaughan Callan, our European Business Manager. Um, we will hear from Vaughan a little later on, um, but also joining us on, on this webinar is Stephen Burns, the Desco Europe Brand Manager. Good morning, Stephen. Morning, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. As Tim said, I'll, I'll add my welcome. Uh, and just to say that uh, I'll be helping out this morning with answering uh, some questions. So on the screen there, you'll see uh, a couple of different ways that it might look, depending on which version uh, you're using. And we'd love you to submit your questions there. Um, obviously, we have uh, prepared uh, our material for this morning's webinar, uh, but we may not cover everything. And we'd love to know the questions that you have uh, so that we can get to as many of those uh, uh, as we can. Um, we're also going to, right at the start here, just launch a quick poll. Um, and this is just to uh, understand a little bit about uh, the, the knowledge that we have together uh, on different types of ESD packaging. So if you could just take uh, uh, five seconds to read through those options there uh, and select the one that's closest uh, to, to yourself. Um, so uh, how would you rate your knowledge of the different types of uh, ESD packaging? The options being, uh, this is your first time uh, looking at this topic. Um, your second option, you know that there are different types, but not all the differences between those types, uh, and possibly not which one you should use in which situation. The third option, uh, is that you have a good understanding of the different types of uh, packaging available and their usage. And the final option, you basically you're a pro and you could give this webinar to us. <laughs> so uh, please take a look at those options. Uh, select one uh, and we'll just give another 10, 15 seconds to that and then we'll uh, hand back to Tim and press forward with the webinar. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, for contributing to the poll. Tim, handing back to you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. So during today's webinar, uh, we'll go through the basics of packaging, and what the standard says. Uh, we'll then look at packaging and storage options. Uh, last, we'll look at uh, testing, and Vaughan will be carrying out some demonstrations a little bit on uh, a little bit later during this webinar. So there are three key requirements for an ESC control plan. Now, uh, in past webinars, we've gone through the grounding conduct uh, conductors and uh, the ionizers and removing and neutralizing insulators. So today we'd like to go through the um, shielding of uh, ESC sensitive devices or ESCS devices when stored or transported outside of the ESC protected area. And this is uh, the one part of uh, the ESC uh, control plan that is, is overlooked compared to the others. So the uh, packaging should act as a Faraday cage, uh, meaning the charges on the outside will rest because the, the like charges repel. Uh, but charges will only be kept on the outside of the packaging if the, if the uh, shielding bag is closed and the conduct, conductive tote box has a lid on the top. Um, and we will uh, have a uh, little demo later showing the difference uh, between um, having the packaging open and closed. So. Uh, as I mentioned on just a second ago, the ESC bag should be closed and containers have lids in place. And the ESC packaging should only be opened as an ESC protective workstation by properly grounded personnel. Otherwise, when you open it, if you're walking around, there is a, a, a chance or the, 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 uh, the items inside will charge up. This is what the standard says. Now, I won't read all of this. Um, there's a lot of information here, but um, a plan should be documented for uh, different ESC protected areas and moving products. If, if you don't have a plan, you are setting yourself up for each operator to, to decide what they can use, uh, resulting in different packaging being used and in some cases no packaging at all. So I'd like you to imagine that you're inside an ESC protected area and there's no ESC safe floor. Uh, and employees are transporting ESC sensitive devices and shelving to a work surface, for example. Uh, if there's no plan in place, the operator could take the device 
out of the bag, placed on top of the bag, thinking that it's protected um, when walking to the ESC workbench from, from the shelving. So that ESC sensitive device will be charging up while the employee's walking across the floor because they're not grounded and there's no shielding uh, barrier for the ESC sensitive device. Um, so therefore, that device will be charging. For packaging outside of the ESC protected area, uh, it should be dissipative or conductive material and a structure that provides electrostatic discharge shielding, meaning that if a bag is uh, used, again, it should be closed. If a tote box is used, the lid should be on the tote box, uh, so the, the packaging has the Faraday cage effect that we spoke about a couple of slides ago. So there are different types of test, uh, test me uh, methods um, for uh, uh, and measuring uh, measurements for testing the electrostatic protected packaging. Now, again, uh, there's a lot of information on this slide, and there's um, some equipment that we will see a little bit later on that you have uh, that, that you can use to test this. But really, a surface resistance test should be uh, performed, a point to point resistance test should be carried out, and a volume resistance test as well. Now the test method for shielding bags is, uh, should be user defined, and we will be crossing to perform. Uh, it will be performing tests on shielding bags uh, a little bit later on in this webinar. Now on your screen now is the equipment that's used for testing uh, packaging. Uh, Vaughan will be using this equipment, so we will start with the concentric ring probe, which is used for resistance measurement for BSC packaging, uh, which includes the static shielding. Uh, bags and, and other bags as well. Uh, the digital surface resistance meter, which is used with the concentric ring probe, and that can measure resistance point to point and resistance to ground. Um, it can also be used for uh, measuring point to point and resistance to ground of work surfaces, flooring, systems, garments, and there we have the, the packaging as well, all in accordance with the European standard. And we have uh, the two point resistance probe, uh, which you can test on small areas. If you have small bags, you have small boxes, um, you, you use the uh, two-point resistance probe. And these are all available to purchase separately. So if you would like any further information on these products, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us and we'll happily provide any uh, information uh, you require. Now we'll look at the packaging and storage options inside the ESC protected area. Uh, and we'll start with the pink antistatic uh, bags and the pink antistatic bubble bags. And th there's a common misjudgment that pink bags can protect ESC uh, sensitive items and uh, they can't unless they are grounded uh, on a work surface. So that charge uh, will uh, dissipate away off the work surface away from the, the bags and, and the devices inside. Now the, the pink antistatic bubble bag uh, provides a, a, a physical protection within the ESC protected area and can be used in, conjun in conjunction with a shielding bag or a container outside of the ESC protected area to provide a low charging physical protection of those products um, inside. And, and again, Vaughan is going to show the difference between a pink bag and a static shielding bag. We'll now move on to the Step 3 Ultra Clear Barrier Bags. Now, these are uh, available in both open and zip top. Uh, and as they're ultra clear, you're able to see what is stored inside the bag. Uh, which leads to a few errors when operators are handling the ESC-sensitive items or devices. Uh, they'll be able to have a look and see before they they pick up the bag to see what is stored inside, um, so they'll know that they have to be grounded before they pick up anything or, or even open them up, and that they have to be opened at an, uh, an ESC uh, work uh, surface or at an ESC workstation. And now we'll move on to the uh, static shielding bags. And again, there is a lot of information on these slides uh, for the different bags, and we will provide the presentation uh, after this webinar. Uh, but we do have different films, uh, and they have different applications. So you can see the, the top row, uh, the first two, sorry, are the metal in bags, and we have a, a metal out bags as well. We will look a, a little bit into the difference between a metal in bag and a metal out bag. Um, but um, no one can offer the, the range that, that we can offer. Um, and I think as you can see on the uh, 1300 series bag, uh, that one, for instance, is custom made, it's not in stock, and we do have a wide range of uh, custom capabilities that we will be looking at a little bit later on. Uh, now, the, 
the 1000 series bag, the Michelin bag, is uh, the most popular. And it can be used for storing PCBs and sensitive devices. Uh, and it is uh, the one that's used for general ESC safe packaging. Uh, whereas the 1300 series you can use for shipping tubes and boxes. Um, and as you go down, I'm going to say, we'll, we'll look at the metal out barrier bags shortly, but um, you've got ones like the, the 2700 series bags, which are problem solvers, which can be used with uh, other shielding bags if you have punctures. So the difference between um, the uh, metal in bags and the metal out structure of bags. Now the metal in bags have a distinctive coating. Uh, the metal out bags are highly conductive uh, as the metal is closer to the outer surface, uh, which will mean that the, the, the charge will go away a lot quickly, uh, a lot quicker. Sorry. Um, so the uh, metal in bags are more suitable for sensitive devices because the charge dissipates at a slower rate, um, and, and that is the, the key difference between the two. We'll, we'll also look at the uh, metal in shield in bubble bags, uh, which is also available in film as well. Now, um, this offers excellent ESC protection uh, with the Faraday cage effect. But it also offers a good mechanical protection as well. And you've got the bubbles and the bubble bags, which are similar to the antiseptic pink bubble bags that we'll provide, but these have the whole shielding as well, uh, acting as a Faraday cage along with the uh, mechanical protection. Um, as the, the bags are partially transparent, it's easy to identify uh, the contents of the bag. Again, to see what is actually stored inside the bag before the operator opens those bags to make sure they are open at an ESC work surface. And these are some of the, the packaging capabilities that we have. Um, if there are any bags that uh, you would like as, as a custom, we can have a look to see um, the, the need for these bags, what, what the um, company would like. Uh, and we're able to, to provide as much information as possible on these. Um, and you can see you've got full, uh, the, the, the tape top bags or the hang hole bags that have become very popular as well. And you have tubing bags as well. Uh, so if there's anything that that you would like, please get in contact with us and we'll happily provide uh, any more information. And, and as I said a couple of slides ago, no one offers uh, what we can offer. But now I'd like to um, pass to Vaughan Callan, who'll be showing us how to test shielding bags and, and, and the difference between pink uh, antiseptic bags and shielding bags. Right, thanks Tim. Um, what we're going to be giving you today during today's webinar, we've already started and we're going to continue to do so, there's going to be a lot of information on different packaging materials. Um, but what I'm going to do is just give you a couple of demonstrations on uh, a few products. And the first product that we're going to be focusing on is the pink anti-static bag. Um, these are used an awful lot in uh, electronics manufacturing. We see time and time again people putting in uh, sensitive components and forged containing sensitive components inside this type of bag. Now this type of bag does not offer any type of shielding. Um, it really is a bag that you would use for bringing non-sensitive components into the work area. And I'm going to do a couple of uh, little demonstrations just to show you the difference between uh, a pink anti-static bag and a static shielding bag. Now, I'll, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch to the overhead camera so you can see in, uh, in, in more close-up detail. Now, what I said was that the uh, pink anti-static bag is um, uh, is just as it says there, it's anti-static, so it won't introduce a charge into the work area. So, to show you that, if I was to take a normal polythene bag, and I have a, a static field meter here, and you can see in the display, the, the digits read uh, thousands, hundreds, and tens. If I was to take a normal polyethylene bag, and I'm going to rub it against my trouser leg to generate a charge and hold it into the charge. We can see here over, there's over uh, over 2,000 volts being generated on that bag. So that is absolutely not the type of material that comes into uh, the work area. If I do the same thing using the uh, pink anti-static bag and rub it against my trouser leg to generate the charge and hold it against the meter, you'll see there is no charge generated. 
So you wouldn't be introducing a charge into the work area. But what they don't do is offer any form of shielding. Now to show you that, if I take the meter and place it inside the pink anti-static bag, and if I take a zero stack gun, uh, and with the zero stack gun, if I just pull the trigger, it will generate a couple of thousand volts, both positive and negative, with each pull of the trigger, or up to a couple of thousand volts. If I do that and, and fire it towards the meter that's inside the bag, you'll see that we're getting, and you look for the peak, and we saw that uh, we got over 400 volts going straight through the bag to the meter inside. So therefore, it's not offering any shielding. Another demonstration that we'll try and do and see what happens is what I've got here is a uh, insulative uh, piece of material and if I pick that up it will should have some charge in it and we might be able to see some of the charge transfer into the meter inside the bag so if I pick it up and then I hold it over there we'll just try that one more time so we got to up to uh, 90 volts so even there um, even just picking up an insulative paddle and placing it over the meter and we saw a peak there of uh, 130 volts. So they don't offer any significant uh, shielding. Now if I place that to one side and if I, do, if I repeat the same demonstration by placing the meter inside a static shielding bag and doing the same thing of, uh, of firing a charge at it using the zero stat meter, and what I'll do, I'll just stand up and try and get this closer into the camera and just look over my shoulder to make sure that I'm getting the, the green light for it to be an in-camera shot and then again fire in the zero stat and you'll see there is no charge going through the bag whatsoever. So for static, true static shielding you need to use a static shielding bag not a pink anti-static bag. The only uh, use of a pink anti-static bag is to bring non-sensitive components into the work area because the bag itself will not generate a charge. Uh, the next uh, small demonstration I'm going to do for you today is the testing of a static shielding bag. And to test a static shielding bag, as called out in the European standard, we need to test the interior of the bag and the exterior of the bag. And both the interior and the exterior of the bag need to be between 10.4 and 10.11 ohms resistance. To make sure that we get a, a good reading, I'm going to place it on a, an insulative surface so we're not picking up any residual resistance uh, from the work surface. So if I turn the meter on, and what we're going to use is a concentric ring probe. And the concentric ring probe is normally when using a resistance meter, you have two uh, 2.5 kilogram weighted probes. Um, what we have here, we have an outer ring and an inner ring, which gives us the same um, resistance as we would get with the, the two separate probes. If I place the bag on the inside of the bag and push the test button, we wait for the reading to come up. Remember, we're looking for a, a resistance inside the bag of between 10.4 and 10.11. And what we have here that you'll see on the camera we have an in, internal resistance of this bag of uh, 3.1319, perfectly within specification. If we repeat the same test with the concentric green probe placed on the outside of the bag, pushing the test button, again, wait for the stabilization period to, uh, to kick in, and then we'll get a reading on the outside of the bag of 3.98 times 10.8, so again, within the European standard specification of 10.4 to 10.11. So those are the two uh, quick demonstrations uh, for today. Now there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot more information coming your way, but if you would like any uh, demonstration on any of our products, that be it packaging or any of our products, please uh, let your inside sales representative know, and we'll be pleased to uh, organise that. And we can hold these virtual demonstrations uh, direct with yourself via uh, GoToMeeting, Skype, Teams, and Zoom. And uh, with that, I'll hand you back to Tim to uh, carry on with the webinar. Thanks, Paul. So on, on your screen now uh, is the Defo Europe bag selection chart. Uh, the chart in this PowerPoint is a, is a link to the selection chart. Um, and and 
um, we, again, we will provide this PowerPoint at the end of the webinar, so you will be able to follow this link. Um, and Tim, I think we've lost you there. Are you still there? Uh, we'd like to look at the... Um... Sorry, Tim. I, sorry to interrupt. We lost the sound for a second there. Could you go back to the selection chart and uh, and just go from there again? Sorry about that. Yeah, um, no worries. Can you hear me now? Is everything... Yes, can... Yeah, can okay. hear you now. Thanks okay. very much. Okay, no worries. Um, so, as I said, on your screen now is the uh, selection chart, and the chart in this PowerPoint is the link um, to the selection chart uh, on the Desco Europe website. Um, and on the selection chart, you have links to each product um, and the surface resistance of the exterior of the bag and the surface resistance of the interior of the bag. Um, we also have the heat sealing conditions as well, uh, if you like to, to seal these bags that way. Uh, we'd like to move on to the uh, moisture barrier bags. Uh, we'll look at the low barrier bags here at first, the 2000 series, which is the top seller for the um, uh, moisture barrier bags. Uh, and then we have the dry field uh, 2700 series, which uh, we'll get onto in a second. But um, you have for the 2000 series, you have the general barrier uh, packaging. And again, it's available in uh, with a zip top or open top. And with the 2700 series bag, um, it's a problem solver for punctured bags, so you can actually use this as well. And again, it's a uh, general barrier uh, packaging bag. So, uh, the, for the high barrier bags, uh, we have the Dry Shield 3000 series, uh, which is recommended for items with uh, sharp edges and it's less likely to tear. Um, the uh, 3400 series bag, which is a higher puncture than the 3000 series bag, because, because these are moisture barrier bags, they are normally um, vacuumed, vacuum sealed. So um, for, for the puncture, so you need to keep an eye on the puncture for each bag as well, and the puncture weight. Uh, and then you, uh, we move on to the 3700 series bag, uh, which again is a problem solver bag for bags that, that are puncher and the, and the 3700 series bag is the highest puncher resistance bag. Uh, on your screens now is uh, the selection chart for the moisture barrier bags. Again, there are uh, links to each product. We have the surface resistance of the exterior of the bag and the interior of the bag. Uh, just like the other selection charts as well, this uh, in the PowerPoint here, this is a link to the selection chart. Um, and you can see on there as well as the, the puncture average so again, if you, if you like to vacuum uh, these bags, uh, it, you really need to know what the, the, the puncture average is for, for each bag as well. Uh, and again, uh, if you like to heat seal these bags, there are the heat sealing conditions of the, the temperature, uh, the pressure and the, and the time. So, uh, Stephen, do we have any questions so far? Thanks, Tim. Yeah, and thank you everybody for uh, submitting your questions. Um, uh, we'll, we'll probably just tackle a couple today. There are a lot of uh, questions, uh, sorry, a couple at, at this point. There are a lot of questions about uh, specific applications um, which are quite detailed and down to um, precise types of product. Uh, so we'll probably handle those directly with you by email because those discussions might become quite in depth. But there are just a couple here that are, let's say, more general, uh, which I think will be helpful for everybody. So we'll take a look at those now. Um, so question here, is it okay to use pink bubble wrap around the product uh, and then place it inside a shielding bag? Uh, and the answer is yes, that's that's absolutely okay, so long as the product is in uh, a shielding uh, uh, packaging as well. Um, it's often necessary to provide both physical and ESD protection uh, to the product. Um, and actually, so, uh, I think, Tim, we already uh, saw it, didn't we, that we do supply a shielding uh, bubble bag to give both of those benefits in one uh, packaging solution. Uh, and the real benefit of that to you 
uh, is the reduced handling time and cost of a double packaging process, first of all in the bubble uh, packaging and then uh, in the shielding packaging. Uh, so we have that option available. Uh, and the next question that we'll cover right now before handing back to Tim is, uh, do you need to use uh, desiccant and humidity cards, uh, humidity indicator cards, if you are using any moisture barrier bag? Um, and I haven't been able to find the information on the JEDEC standard just yet. So, so the JEDEC standard covers uh, packaging and storage of moisture sensitive devices. Um, so we'll we'll check the what the standard calls out specifically for that. But it, what I would want to say is that the three products are definitely designed to be used as a system. So the, those three products being the bag, the desiccant and the humidity indicator card. Um, it's important to know that moisture barrier bags are not totally impervious to moisture on the selection chart that we've seen there is a, an MVTR specification. So some will have uh, more moisture vapor control than others, um, but none of them are totally impervious to moisture. So the purpose of the desiccant then is to absorb any moisture that does transmit through the film. Uh, and the purpose of the humidity indicator card is to validate how much moisture protection uh, the product had during storage. So obviously if you if you open it up and the uh, humidity indicator card shows uh, clear, you know that it was fully protected. Uh, conversely, if you find that it's showing a uh, high moisture, you know that something failed during the process and that that tells you that that particular board or that particular pack of components is maybe question, questionable before you go ahead and continue with production. Um, so definitely the three are designed to be used as a system. Um, we'll, we won't just follow up with the questions we haven't answered by email, we'll also send these answers to the people that ask them. So the person that asked that question, if you want to come back at us and ask a little bit more on that, uh, happy to carry that conversation forward. Uh, but for now, I'll hand back to Tim for the second part of the webinar, which uh, is much shorter, isn't it, Tim, than the first part? It is, yes, it is, yeah. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, so we will move on to the uh, SDF uh, mill spec bag. Now, um, we know that there's not a lot of uh, customers or that may be interested in these, uh, or, or it may not apply to, to everyone. Um, but uh, SDS is only one of uh, two approved manufacturers of uh, mill spec bags. Um, like I said, we will um, go over this a little bit quickly. There are standards for these as well, but if you would like any further information on these bags, uh, please contact us uh, and we will happily answer any questions, uh, questions that you may have. Um, Please ask the webinar. You'll, you'll find my details on the screen at the end. So we'll, we'll now move on to um, our distributive impregnated corrugated packaging solution. Um, so these uh, avoid uh, rapid discharge when contacting ESC sensitive items. So the uh, conductive uh, coated boxes do not. So as you can see on the image on the right hand side, you have a static surface and in a very shielding layer in the protective pack box, which is the image on the left-hand side there. Um, and then you have other coated material where the shielding layer, uh, which normally, which is paint, is just in the top layer. When that is uh, taken off it through wear and tear, or if you have some tape on there, you take the tape off, you will find that paint just comes off. Um, and that will mean that it's the, the product inside and not protected. Um, so I'm gonna have a look at that in a little bit more detail here. So you can see the distributive impregnated corrugated material, the protective pack box, the one on the top. Um, so it doesn't lose its ESC property. You can see that there, there may have been um, some sort of tape or a label on there. The label's been taken off and that top layer has been removed. Uh, but it will not lose its ESC properties because of the shielding layer um, is it, so far down in uh, in that packaging. Whereas the coated material, the shielding layer is on the, on the surface. Uh, you put the label again or some cellar tape. Um, or even just rubbing the boxes together over time, uh, that coated layer will remove um, and it's not as long lasted and the uh, ESC material is fragile and, and prone just to actually rub off, like they start packing and moving together. There's a chance that, that that can fall off. 
and we will look at that in the, the more detail uh, in a slide time. Uh, but the um, protective pack uh, container is enclosed. The, the buried shielding layer provides the same uh, uh, ESD um, shielding uh, as uh, well, a, a shielding layer as the static shielding bag. Um, so the, the, that very layer pr provides that DSC shielding and it protects all the contents from electrostatic charges and discharges. Um, but it, is, it, it really is worth noting um, that these boxes do have the same uh, protection as, a, as an ESC shielding bag. Now what I'd like to do um, now is go back to uh, Vaughan Callan, who will show us um, how to test the protective pack box and to also um, perform a scratch test as well on the coated material and the protective pack box. Yeah, thanks Tim and uh, welcome back everybody. As you know before we were looking at uh, the difference between a pink bag and a shielding bag and uh, how you can test the shielding bag. What we're going to do now is just take a few minutes of your time to show you how you can test uh, conductive boxes and uh, other uh, flexible packaging. So we go to the overhead camera and what we have here is one of our protective pack uh, component uh, boxes. And again, using the concentric ring probe, you can simply place it on top of the, uh, the box, turn the meter on and uh, hit the test button and uh, wait for the stabilization period. So therefore you can see straight away 3.88 times 10.5. Now that's good for a box of this size, but you will often get uh, boxes of uh, like this or maybe component trays where you're not able to use the, uh, the concentric ring probe. What you can do in that case is you can take the, uh, the two prong probe, again inserting the leads into the appropriate socket and then simply placing it onto the surface, push down and hit the test button and once again we're getting a reading which is pretty much uh, very close to what we had with the concentric ring probe this time it's 9.7315 and you can also use uh, the, uh, the two prong probe to even test inside the box if we open the box out again hit the test button, place the probe inside, and this is even using the, uh, the pink anti-static foam that's inside, but it will also be able to give us a, a good reading inside the box. And there we have uh, 7.8218. So, so this is where you can use for testing uh, conductive card boxes or uh, component trays, or tote boxes. You can either use the concentric ring probe or if they are too small for the concentric ring probe, you can use the uh, two-prong probe that comes with it, that comes with the kit, rather, sorry. And the other thing I just wanted to draw your attention to is if I move this out of the way, is um, we were just looking at one of our protective pack uh, impregnated material uh, boxes. Um, these are cards that we have, and, and you, can, you can request these. And I just wanted to do a quick uh, demonstration for you because the... Uh, Protective pack impregnated card is, as it says, it's impregnated all the way through. It's completely uh, uh, shielding all the way through. We have a buried shielding layer. So if I was to scratch the card rather aggressively with this uh, paper clip, you'll see that it's, it's remaining uh, uh, ESD safe through, through, throughout its entirety. If I do the same test with uh, a, a painted card, can you see already that the uh, the paint is coming off and we're actually exposing just a card with no ESD property. So the protective pack box is going to be uh, shielding all the way through and for uh, longevity and for consistency of electrical properties then um, that would be a good option for you other, as opposed to most of the others in the marketplace that are either coated or a, a painted material. So once again, that was just a very quick demonstration, a couple of minutes of your time, and uh, once again, thank you, and I'll hand you back to Tim. Thanks, Vaughan. 
Um, so as you can see, Protected Pack can be used uh, throughout the ESG control process. And if you would like any more information, uh, please get in contact with us and we will happily uh, provide uh, any information that you require regarding uh, this material. Um, so, Stephen, do we have any uh, further questions? Hi, Tim. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions here that we will cover. Uh, and again, like I said earlier on, sorry to repeat myself, but we, we, we're we not going to get to all of the questions, uh, but we will follow up with uh, those we don't answer by email. Uh, so, uh, and, and in fact, before we get into the questions, we just have um, a, a really quick poll to put on the screen, uh, and it's to, to basically to ask if you'd like to see any samples of the products that we've uh, displayed today. Um, so just take a moment to, to answer that yes or no. Uh, if you if you answer yes, of course, we'll get in touch with you to, uh, to ask which products you're interested in seeing a sample of, um, and then we'll organize to ship those out to you. So uh, take a moment to answer that, and we'll just go through two or three questions that we have here. So first question we'll look at, is it okay to use conductive trays to transport our PCBs to and from different areas of the facility? Um, and really we would need to ask two questions to give you an answer uh, for that. So the first is, do you go outside of the designated ESD protected area? Uh, and the second question is, uh, as you go around the facility, will you be grounded at all times? So that would be most likely via footwear and the floor. Um, and by the way, that would need to meet the specification for a primary means of ground. So the whole system would need to be less than uh, 3.5 times 10 to the seven. Uh, and also the system would need to, you'd need to do the body voltage test to make sure that you, the average of the five highest body voltage peaks is less than 100 volts. So if you answer uh, uh, no to both of those, sorry, let me say let me say that again. If you go outside of the ESD protected area, the designated ESD protected area, then the product must be shielded. Uh, the standard says that if it's going outside of the EPA, then the product must be shielded. Uh, and the other question, even if you're inside the EPA, but the floor is not a primary means of ground, uh, then also you need to protect the product. So it, it really depends on, on those two things. If you're staying within the EPA, so it's possible to designate the whole building as an EPA, uh, and uh, you'll be grounded throughout your journey from your workbench to the stores area, uh, or from one area to another through the floor, then you don't need to uh, shield the products along those journeys. Uh, another question here, so it's about the protective pack boxes, a clarification question. Does that mean that we can consider uh, the corrugated packaging as a shield, just like metalized bags? Uh, and the answer is yes. So there's a buried shielding layer. Uh, the material that comes into intimate contact with the product is uh, dissipative so it meets the, the, the specification on both of those fronts uh, and we've got third-party testing uh, to show that um, and uh, just to give a, another couple of benefits compared to uh, so Vaughan was showing us the scratch test where uh, you, even if you scratch or let's say you use a packaging sellotape and remove it that will remove the conductive paint off of the coated material uh, it won't remove or even if it removes a top layer uh, from our products there are many more layers beneath uh, to continue to provide that dissipative outer surface and the buried shielding layer is still protected um, but another benefit therefore is uh, a foreign object debris uh, a, a FOD issue uh, and so ours won't uh, leave that particulate on the product like some uh, or most, in fact, uh, uh, coated materials will do. Um, just a, a final question that we'll cover now uh, before Tim wraps up the webinar for us. Um, 
the question is if we store all our sensitive devices in closed shielding bags or boxes do we need to ground the shelves that they are stored on the answer per the standard is that it's not required uh, so once a product is in a shielding uh, packaging of some sort bag or box uh, they don't need to be stored on a grounded surface the user guide does still recommend that you do that and the reason the user guide gives is because of the confusion there can be uh, for employees uh, to know the difference between firstly uh, uh, different types of shelving so is that a grounded surface or is it not and secondly uh, will all uh, employees know whether a product has been placed inside uh, shielding uh, packaging or not so that is for the sake of the employee uh, and it this user guide then goes on to recommend that it would be a good idea uh, to use uh, some sort of shelf liner material and turn the shelf into a, a grounded surface for the sake of uh, making sure that employees don't make make mistakes about where they place sensitive product um, as a as, so we do have very cost effective uh, shelf liner material for that purpose um, the alternative to that is and the user guide also mentions this uh, alternative is to mark shelves very clearly uh, as to whether they are grounded ESD uh, surfaces or not uh, so um, it's, it's to answer the question directly it's not a requirement but it is a recommendation uh, that the, the user guide makes and we would agree with that recommendation uh, thanks to everybody who has uh, submitted their response in the poll we'll uh, be in touch with you following uh, to organize your samples as requested um, thanks for those questions that we haven't been able to answer we'll get back to you uh, by email uh, and uh, Tim, I'm going to hand back to you to wrap us up. Thanks, Stephen, and thanks for all of your questions as well. So um, on your screen now is uh, my contact details. So if there are any other questions that you think of after this webinar, uh, please don't hesitate to get in contact with us and we'll happily answer any of those questions. We've also provided some more resources, so the Depot Europe website where you can have a look at the selection chart. And there's also the IEC website where you can purchase uh, the European standard and we'll have all of the, the test requirements and test, test and, uh, measurements there um, for, for your record. Um, but thank you for your time and we hope that you can join us next week, uh, which I believe is on, uh, our webinar is on ESP smocks and garments. Um, so you'll see the, uh, the invitation for that one in, in the next day or so. Uh, but thank you again for your time and uh, have a good day.